How many people have, uh, have, here have heard how, I don't want to be a Christian because I have to follow all these rules, you know, and, and there's all these things I have to do. Um, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a slave to, to other people's needs and wants and all that other stuff. Anybody ever heard that? Where Christianity is just nothing but a bunch of rules. I find that pretty funny because since I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I found that now I have the freedom to read this instruction guide to life and live a life I never could imagine. Let's start at verse 1. Galatians 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. My friends, Christ has freed all believers. We should live with joy in knowing that Christ has set us free <clears throat> from the legalistic formulas of the Old Testament, from God's judgment upon sin, from our experiences of fear and guilt. We are now free to live out the Bible to practice it, to rejoice in it. You know, what does it say in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32? Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the truth is this. Jesus Christ came down on this earth to minister to us, to die, for us, so that we now have, can have a personal, loving relationship with this all-powerful, almighty God. To now have a life of purpose. He set us free from drugs, from alcohol, from whatever addictions you might have or set you free from the fact that you feel like your life is not going anywhere, that you have no direction. He sets us free from whatever it is that's holding us back. Because each and every one of us struggle in some way with something. It doesn't have to be drugs and alcohol. It could be almost anything. And Christ gives us the power to set ourselves free from that because the truth does set us free. I've learned from this truth that it's not a book of rules for me to follow, but it's a way of learning to live life in a way that I will be blessed. I'll never forget when I first became a believer. Now, I was raised in a Presbyterian church. There's a lot of good Presbyterians out there. The denomination that I was involved in didn't believe in the Bible. All those times at church, I never really knew what the Bible said. I would look at this Bible, and it would just be mere words. Until I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and suddenly all this came alive. Do you remember when you first believed how all of a sudden this hunger and thirst for this was just, you couldn't stop reading it. You couldn't stop getting enough of it. Because when you believe in Jesus Christ, he sets us free to understand what he has outlined for our lives. And i got to tell you, it's a beautiful thing. What he has in store for each and every one of you. Now, I say it's a beautiful thing, but I also tell you, um, I'm not one of those pastors that says, if you believe in Jesus, your life will become easy. <laughs> boom, boom, everything disappears. Wouldn't that be great? No, that's not how it works. Life can stink. You've got to be honest, right? But with Jesus Christ, I found that I'm never alone. You know? you know, Dan talked about crying together. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. I was at a difficult point in my life. And Christ sent me Dan to be able to just sit and talk about it. You know, that's what community is all about, is we don't understand it, that, that Christ gives us the blessing of all these other people to lift us up, to pray for us, and all those things. He sets us free. 
Now, in this case here, Paul wants to say this and, and, and emphasize it so importantly because the Judaizers in, in this area were trying to force the Galatians to go back to the Old Testament law. That, that this gospel of being set free was of no use unless you follow the Old Testament laws, which included circumcision. That's what it was all about. But Jesus says, mark my word, or Paul says, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value at all. Now, obviously, only men could be circumcised. Am I right? There's a certain truth in that. Okay. All right. But you see, it was more than just circumcision here that was at stake. Paul was confronting the Galatians because they were trying to fulfill the Jewish law. Now, Paul had nothing against circumcision. If you remember, he had Timothy circumcised. But why did he have Timothy circumcised? It had nothing to do with Timothy fulfilling the Old Testament law <coughs> that was necessary. See, Paul had Timothy circumcised so that to enable Timothy to be able to reach people for Jesus Christ. It had nothing to do with fulfilling the law. See, and the Judaizers taught that the gospel needed the Jewish law system to make it perfect. But God's way was different. Salvation through Jesus Christ by grace alone, purely because God loves us for no other reason. Well, let's go on and look at verses 3 through 5. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. What Paul's saying is if the Galatians allowed themselves to be circumcised, they would be admitting that Christ's death was not sufficient. That it was of no use. In other words, once again, you're enslaved to a law that was created to show us how much we needed Jesus. How many of you here keep the Ten Commandments and never fail? That's right. You know why? Because God created the law and showed us all throughout the Old Testament Israel's struggle to, without Jesus, to be able to fulfill that law, and they never did. And my friends, let's admit it, we can't either. And that's why God sent Jesus. So what Paul's saying here is, if you are being circumcised, you're saying that this law is more important to Jesus Christ, than Jesus Christ, then Jesus dying for you meant nothing. And it means, oh, Oh, so much in our lives. And then he continues in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. See, he's not coming out against the people being circumcised. Like I said, he, he circumcised Timothy. But for a reason that had nothing to do with fulfilling the law. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is is faith expressing itself through love. See, Paul made the point that neither circumcision or uncircumcision has any value for salvation. We are saved by faith alone. Do you believe that? Do you take hold of that? Now, Paul said, hey, it's okay to work. You know, you can do works, because uh, to, to, for me, my works are an expression of my love and gratitude for what Jesus has done. He says, it's okay to work, but don't try to earn your salvation. Nobody in the Old Testament or New Testament earned our salvation by keeping the law. 
See, everybody in the Old Testament, you know how they earned their salvation? They earned their salvation because they believed in the promise of this coming Christ, of this Messiah. Look at David, a man after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. I, I, I recall something about adultery and murder happening there. Yet David was a man after God's own heart. Because he believed in the promise. He believed in the promise of the coming Messiah. Enough that he was willing, when he failed God, to confess and repent. A man after God's own heart. And what Paul's also saying here is, don't try and earn your salvation, but instead, let your salvation by faith result in loving and kind works done to serve others. See, genuine faith in, in Christ is expressed in our love for others. What does Jesus tell us to do? Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. And I found something interesting there. If you look at that love in the Greek, now you know you realize there are several words for love in Greek. One is eros, which we won't talk about, all right, because we've got youngsters here. Another one is phileo love, a brotherly love. That's an easy love. You know, Dan, I love you, man. I love you a lot. Um, as a brother in Christ, I love you. But if you mess up, I don't know, man. I'm not so sure about that. See, then there's another love, a love that only comes from God through Jesus Christ, and that's agape love. It's an unconditional love. It's a love that means no matter how you hurt me, I'm still going to love you. It's a love we can't do without Jesus Christ in our lives. And that's what Jesus says, love your neighbor. He's saying agape your neighbor. That means love them no matter what they do, no matter what their sins, to love them, to love your enemy. Oh, come on, God, love your enemy unconditionally? I don't even like the guy. Love. It means serving in ways that, are, that knows no bounds. It means serving each other. You know, we're a community of faith. It means going outside those windows into that mission field and finding ways to serve others. You know, because if you want to hear the greatest expression of evangelism, that would be to love your neighbor and love your enemy. Because then, as they, the guys talked about, um, you get to do the real simple task of evangelism, which is to tell your story. When you love somebody unconditionally, trust me, they're going to get curious as to how, why, why you can even do that. And you get a chance to tell your story. To love. Our genuine faith in Christ can be expressed in our love for others. Let me continue in verse 7 here. You were running a good race. Paul likes to talk about races. He does that in Philippians, too. You were running a good race. He's like, dude, you were going. You were doing the right things. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. What he's saying is here, what the Judaizers are telling you to do or requiring did not come from Jesus. He said, the Galatians were running well. Man, dude, you're, you're doing the right things. You're on the right path. They'd accepted the gospel of salvation. Not only had they believed, but they were living out their faith, allowing it to shape their lives. They were obeying the truth and using this as an instruction guide for how they lived life. But despite their good start, someone had cut in on them. See, he's using the analogy of a race where a runner would cut in front of another runner and cause that runner to stumble, um, which I thought was, was, was great because I don't know if you've ever heard of Eric Liddell, great missionary. Um, he was also one of the best runners in the world of his day. And they, they tell the story of Eric Liddell in a major race going against his major competitor, who, if you ever get to watch the movie Chariots of Fire, you can see how this major competitor always struggled with worldly fame, the need for worldly fame. 
Well, during this race, Eric Liddell gets cut off by that runner, falls into the inside of the track. Now, did Eric give up? No. With the cheering on of people, they're like, get up, get up, you're still in the race. Eric got up, ran that race, and I, I don't know if you've ever seen, he had the worst running style on the face of the earth. He ran kind of like this. Well, through the strength that he had, he not only caught up to those people, he passed everybody and won the race. Now, the world would say, okay, he has every right to turn around to that runner and cut him off and give him a little pop or, you know, do, like we do now, you know, everybody does the little dance like, hey, 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 you know, that type of thing, you know, trash talk. <laughs> But Eric Liddell went up to that man, shook his hand, and said, great race. That was Eric Liddell. He'd been cut off. That's what Paul is talking about here. You're running the race well. Don't allow it to cut you off. Don't let, let these Judaizers come in and cut you in the middle of this race you're running so well and throw you off. This battle with Satan is serious. And Satan would love to get us off track. Would love to get us off track. Verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, Paul goes in to further describe what he's talking about here. He said, um, the idea of, of letting stuff get in the way. He talks about yeast. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever they may be. Anybody here ever make bread? Yeah. You've got all these ingredients, right? And the whole key to the whole bread is this little teeny packet of yeast. Without that yeast... You're not making bread, you're making a brick. Am I right? See, now what we see here are two kinds of yeast, all right? Um, he's showing, Paul's trying to show us how this little bit of yeast that makes the bread so wonderful, um, how, how in addition to that, the wrong yeast, in this case, uh, the amount of evil, a small amount of evil, can affect a large group. <coughs> i got to tell you, friends, in the type of work I do with churches in conflict, that evil comes from right in the pews with people who claim to know the Bible well but want to bully their way and seek their will as opposed to God's will. A little bit of yeast can affect a church in a mighty powerful way. You know, we have Satan's yeast, which can produce guilt, oppression, accusation, bondage to sinful habits, a troubled conscience. In the churches, I've seen it as people who are constantly pointing the finger at everybody else. And they know the Bible inside and out, but they never take that finger and look at themselves. I have seen it destroy... Church after church after church. People are held up as pillars of the church because of their knowledge of the Bible. Who follow the law more than they follow the freedom. A little bit of yeast in the wrong direction can be very harmful to a church. See, instead of Christ's yeast, God's yeast, which produces guiltless freedom, life affirmation. See, we should be affirming each other, holding each other accountable when we do wrong. But have you ever seen in Galatians 6.1 how you hold somebody accountable? What does it say to do? It says to restore a sinner gently. If 
If a sinner isn't running the race well and they stumble, do we push them up, push them down, or help them get up so that they continue to run the race? Vitally important. You know, Paul talks about running the race. We all want to run the race, but guess what? We all sin. Who here does not sin? Wait a minute. Let me put my hand down. I don't know about you, but when I sin, I do want to be held accountable for it. I want somebody, like Samuel did to David, to come to me and say, dude, you're going wrong. But at the same time, it's up to me to be humble enough to confess and repent of that sin. In a lot of churches that I've worked at in conflict, nobody wants to confess and repent. And I've discovered something so valuable in my life that I didn't always know as a pastor. I've discovered that a daily life of confession and repentance isn't so that I can feel shame and guilt for what I've done wrong, but so that I can take ownership of this reality that Jesus Christ died for me. I don't have to defend myself when I do wrong, because guess what? Christ is up there in the heavenly realms as your mediator defending you every day. Yes, he's done wrong, but he's mine. And confession and repentance has made me a different man. Because it reminds me of the grace I've been given by God. And it enables me, when others sin, to follow Galatians 6 1 and restore them gently. How many here, if you're sin, want people to push you down and point fingers at you? Would you rather them say, yes, you did wrong? But you know what? I'm going to walk with you to right the right. That's what I want to see in a community of faith. You know, in case you haven't noticed, this is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. Yes, I know that's a blah, blah, blah saying that everybody uses, but the truth still matters. We're all sinners saved by grace. So instead of beating each other down, let's help each other up. Let's walk this walk together. Let's walk this struggle together. Let's be the kind of yeast that raises a good, tasty bread. So when it comes out of the oven, you're going, oh, man, this is going to be good. As opposed to producing a brick that's lifeless and dull and has no taste. But let's continue on because I'm doing a lot of talking, but Paul talks a lot better than I do. So he continues in 11. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. Isn't that interesting? Paul's message of the cross of Christ was offensive. Well, that doesn't happen now, does it? Nobody's offended by anything we say, right? Why is that? Because the Paul's message was offensive because it was a constant stumbling block to the Jews just like it is a constant stumbling block to those who don't know who Jesus Christ is. I remember before I knew Jesus, I looked at you people like, what's wrong with those people? Nobody's ever going to get me on my knees accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's stupid. Of course, I still remember on March 17th in 1996 at 4.03 a.m. being on my knees accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. All those stumbling blocks got pushed away. If Paul's message wasn't coupled with persecution, then you've got to believe Paul's message is as meaningless. Because Paul's message, like the message we have, causes us and others to look in the mirror. And it'll always be a stumbling block. 
That's why Jesus says, love agape your neighbors. Love agape your enemies. Because the only way you're going to bring people to Jesus Christ is not by me preaching or you preaching, which is not a bad thing in itself. But what speaks louder than words? Action. Who we are as people. Now here comes one... This next passage is really interesting. All right, I'm going to read this for you. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Okay, ouch. Did you hear what he just said? He said, okay, so all you guys who are pushing for circumcision, he wants you to do what? No, you don't even have to answer that question. We all know the answer. I'm like, Paul, dude, that is harsh. But if you ever study Martin Luther um, and you read some of his writings, Martin Luther, how can I put this nicely, was not afraid to be quite clear what he thought of those who were working against them. Something about the south side of a donkey or something. Uh, he literally wrote this in a letter that went out to everyone. Um, he even drew an illustration in case anybody couldn't figure it out. And I'm like, Martin, dude, that's harsh. But when you get to understand the life of Martin Luther, you'll also understand the life of Paul. Martin, like Paul, was a pastor who had a pastoral love for people and wanted to see them come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And therefore, when people got in the way for their own needs, for their own issues, for their own greed, he got a little angry. And it expresses himself, just like we see here in verse 12, just like we saw with Martin Luther when he told what that Catholic bishop uh, was really looked like. Uh, you know, it was because of the pastoral love for the people that they got this angry over people for, for the sake of greed, for the sake of their own wants, for the sake of their own needs, would put a stumbling block in the way of people getting that freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to excuse Paul for verse 12. Anybody with me on that? Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. There's a couple times where I've come close to saying that kind of stuff. Um, but I thought, wow, Paul, wow, that's in the sacred scriptures. You know what else is in the sacred scriptures? The fact that um, God spoke through a jackass, a mule. Did you know that? And I thought, well, that's pretty cool, because I think he does that with me every day. So let's continue on now that Paul has just said something that's rather frightening. Let's see what he says from there. Okay, verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, by the way, were called to be free. Now, he's very important. He wants everybody to understand you've been set free. You're out of the Satan's cage, but... Do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. See, what he's saying here is Christian freedom cannot be defined as permission to do anything we want. Rather, it's an opportunity to do what Christ wants in our lives. Without fear that our performance will be counted against us. See, we always think that... Um, our trophy is the lives saved through us, right? That's not, that's not how God defines success. Because if, I, if it was all about the trophies of the people I've saved, all right, one in what, every 10,000? Then how many anti-trophies do I have of those that I lost? See, that's not what success is about. Success is in our faithfulness to continue to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, to show not just verbally but physically and in action who Jesus is and what he's done in our lives. Success is in faithfulness. 
Now, he, I can take this a step further because he talks about, um, you know, don't indulge in your sin, sinful nature, rather serve one another in love. See, he's, what he's actually saying is almost that we need to become slaves to one another. We need to stop focusing on our own needs and our own selfish wants and to start focusing on the needs of others. Not just out there in that world, but even within our own faith community. Philippians 2.4, one of my favorite verses. Um, churches in conflict, you'll see why I use this verse. They probably hear it a gazillion times. And it goes like this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility considers others better than yourself. Now here's the key. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. If churches would do that, <clears throat> there would not be conflict in churches. It wouldn't happen. Because what happens, what, what is, what, where is conflict created? It's when our desires and needs are not being met and are being stopped by somebody else. Well, if we're focused on the interests of others, we're not really focused on ourselves and our needs and desires. So guess what? Conflict can't happen. It can't happen. Focus not just on the interest of yourselves, but in the interest of others. In other words, one step further is to literally become slaves to one another. And then he continues in verse 14. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Oh, oh here it is. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, being the Bible nerd that I am, and Dan's the same way, I had to see which Greek word do they use for love. Guess which one it is? Agape, the one that we can't do without a love of Jesus Christ in our lives. Love your neighbor yourself. We cannot love our neighbor without being in Christ. I don't see how it's possible. Our flesh, our sinful human desires, takes away our freedom in Christ and uses it to create insensitivity and disregard for other neighbors. You know, I'm teaching a class at Viterbi University right now uh, that where they have to serve the common good. They actually have to, to contemplate doing community service. And one of the things they mention when it comes to their neighbors is they're so busy in their life and they're so wrapped up in so many other things that at best they go high to their neighbor. Yet Jesus tells us, love your neighbor as yourself. It means going beyond anything you could imagine. And I don't think we can do that without Jesus in our lives. Because some of my neighbors can be annoying. We may show love at times, and to a few, but it's very difficult to, to maintain a loving attitude in our own strength. And that's where Jesus comes in. We have two indispensable helps. One, the Holy Spirit. See, when you believe, when you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into you to be your guide, to be your conscience. For me... The Holy Spirit helped me open up what these words meant. We have that, and we have the reminder of Christ's compassion and forgiveness. Christ forgives us and loves us unconditionally, which should inspire us to love others unconditionally. And then finally in verse 15, he, he, Paul finishes up with, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, whoa, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. This is another verse I love to preach at churches in conflict. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. See, when we lose our motivation for love, we become critical of people. We stop looking for the good in them and only see their faults. Soon, we lose our unity as a church. If you don't believe this, my friend, then you explain to me why the last three churches I've gone to were falling apart. Because of this right here. Churches that abuse pastors.
Yeah. Well, I tried and he did it. <clears throat> Every one of them were churches that had kicked their pastor out after abusing him thoroughly. And you walk in there, <clears throat> and I meet people constantly going like this to each other, with people bullying. I, I'll never forget the, the, the one instance where the youth director accidentally made a comment about Jesus that was not biblical. And 30 seconds later, he corrected himself. All right, that's a good thing. That's what you want to see. And then you want to follow up and make sure he understands where, where it was incorrect. No, but in this church, two ladies wanted him fired, kicked out of the church to never be forgiven. And I'm afraid, my friends, that happens in one too many churches. And that's not the community of faith that God created. You know, when I was last year, I, I preached on Acts 2, 42 through 47. What the, the, everybody had everything in common. They were gathering together. They were fellowshipping together. They were praying together. And I can tell you, friends, when somebody fell, they were there to pick that person up. And how did that paragraph end? And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, you guys are a church that's doing well. You're running the race. The whole idea is to continue to run that race. Not focusing on what your will is for the church, but coming together and praying to seek God's will for the church. I had an interesting story that Erica shared with me not too long ago about this pastor talking to a gentleman about um, receiving Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. The gentleman said, I just can't do it right now. I need to research the church, which always cracks me up. I remember when Eric and I were contemplating, you know, we have kids now, so we should, of course, have some sort of faith. So we did what every good yuppie does, and we went to Barnes & Nobles to get a book on religion, you know, perfect you know, I, I, what was the one? Buddhism and you, perfect together. Um, so, so you want to be a Quaker, you know, that kind of thing. Um, this guy here wanted to research the church. 2,000 years of the history of the church. He came back to that pastor after all that research and said, I'm ready. I believe Jesus Christ has to be real. There is no doubt in my mind. And the pastor said, why? He says, well, I researched 2,000 years of the church, and I saw people biting each other, devouring each other, fighting each other within the church. Constant division and controversy. And yet the church is still alive. There has got to be a God. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, <laughs> somehow, you keep this going despite us. But at the same time, Lord, you show us a better way. A way where we can hold each other accountable. But only because we've searched our own hearts and look at our own sin and know that we've been forgiven so that therefore we too also can forgive and hold each other and lift each other up so that we all finish the race because that's what it's all about is to finish that race, to continue this journey throughout our lives of getting to know your word, to serve you, to love others, to, to show others the way to Jesus Christ, and all those things. And you give us each other to be able to accomplish that. Lord, I pray that you will continue to bless this church that they will continually pray to seek your will, that division will not come amongst them, 
but that even when there's disagreements, there'll be biblical communication with love as we all struggle to seek your will in our lives and the life of the church. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.